All right, so welcome, guys. Um, today, the 25th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So if you would, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O God, who willed that your only begotten Son should undergo the cross to save the human race, grant, we pray, that we, who have known the, his mystery on earth, may merit the grace of his redemption in heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so like it says, 25th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And the Old Testament reading that we get is from Amos, which we don't we don't get a lot from Amos. It's very short. And then uh, 1 Timothy and then the Gospel of Luke. So jumping right in, when you when you read Amos, and then especially how you would connect it to the gospel, it's uh, the, the readings this week are really about it's comparing the kingdom of God to the kingdom of man, right? It's comparing it's comparing how what is considered success in the human world versus what is considered, I guess, for lack of a better term, you know, success in the in the spiritual world and and how when those things start to come into conflict with each other, uh, how it becomes very apparent which which version of success you are chasing after. OK, so. So, like I said, uh, just kind of listen for that. So in Amos, he says. Hear this, you who trample upon the needy. So remember, Amos a pro is a prophet. He's talking to uh, the Jewish population, and he is uh, trying to remind them that God will come, and what's going to happen, where are the people going to be when God, when God comes, when God's justice is brought to them. Hear this, you who trample upon the needy and destroy the poor of the land. When will the new moon be over, you ask, that we may sell our grain, and the Sabbath, that we may display the wheat? We will diminish the ephah, add to the shekel, and fix our scales for cheating. We will buy the lowly for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Even the refuse of the wheat we will sell. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, never will I forget a thing they have done. So what Amos is talking about, he, he's saying that, hear this, you who trample upon the needy. So the idea is, you know, you're thinking that you're going to have time. You're going to be able to do whatever you want. You're going to be able to be this horrible person. And then God's going to show up and you're going to have time to make your repentance. And Amos is saying that even if that is true, God is saying, never will I forget a thing that they have done. And you look at what they're doing. This is uh, Amos's vision of the worldly people. They say, when will the moon, new moon be over and the Sabbath? So basically they're saying, because, you know, they can't work on the Sabbath. So what they're saying is they don't care about the Sabbath. They don't, they'll observe the Sabbath because they have to, because that's their culture and they have to get along in their culture. And I will say, sadly, this reminds me of a lot of like, uh, you know, how so many politicians suddenly become very religious around election time, right? They're, they're eager to flout. Oh, I go to church. Oh, I do this. I do that. And but then as soon as they get elected, you know, you you never hear about it again. Uh, so the idea is, you know, they, they would go to synagogue or they would go to the temple, they would observe the Sabbath, but then they just couldn't wait for the Sabbath to be over. Because that's when they could get back to what they really cared about, which was business. And, you know, when I read this, the first thing I think about is it's like Ebenezer Scrooge, right, that he wanted. He he'll 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 begrudgingly give you know Cratchit Christmas Day off, but he wants him back early on December twenty sixth, right? Because there's money there's money to be made, and that's really what's important. And 
and these things, all these, this religious stuff and these holidays are getting in the way of me <laughs> making my money. And then you look at the way he describes how the rich operate. He says, they will diminish, diminish the effa, add to the shekel. So basically we're talking about they're mucking around with the currency, right? It's, it's um, you know, to me, it reminds me of like, you know, these like hedge fund operators and things like that, that, you know, they'll go buy up a bunch of this to run the price up and then they'll turn around and short sell it and do all this kind of stuff where they're, they're trying to manipulate the currency. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this morning, it was on the news this morning where they said that there were 97 congressmen who were found out to have um, bought into companies that benefited from contracts that were awarded by their congressional committees. That's 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 what Amos is talking about. That kind of idea, you know. I'm going to, you know, I, I I'm going to, you know, I'm I'm going to start a building project on behalf of of whatever. I'm going to start this building project on behalf of the king, and then I'm going to be the one that selects the contractor. But when I select the contractor, the contractor is going to give me a good deal, but I'm not going to tell the king he gave a good deal. So me and the contractor are both going to make extra money. And then I'm going to turn around and buy stock in the contractor's company uh, right before he, you know, when it's still low, right before it's announced that he just got a royal contract. Right. And then the stock's going to go up and then I'll make a bunch of money. And so will the contractor. And then I'll sell it all real quick and we'll all be rich. And, and then he says, and fix our scales for cheating, which obviously you guys, you know, you, you know what that means, that they're, you know, uh, messing with the weight on the scale so that they can cheat. And then the worst part to me is when he says, and buy the poor for a pair of sandals. He's Amos is talking about people that have a level of wealth and influence that they really can take advantage of people who have nothing um, because the people who have nothing can't just go somewhere else. They can't just say, I'm not going to work for you because if you don't work for me, you don't work for anyone. If you don't work. So I'm going to, I'm going to pay you half of what I should because you don't have a choice. Okay. The really awful people. Okay. And this is a, in Amos's vision. Mm -hmm. This is how the world operates. And what is he saying? The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Never will I forget a thing that they have done that if, if you spend your life, treating other people poorly and cheating other people and just generally being a jerk, I guess, is, is what it would be, you know, just generally being a jerk. Um, if you spend your life doing that, God is not going to forget that. And, and there, and, and a lot of times you actually do see, uh, you actually do see in, in that where even within their lives, they it, it all kind of all comes crashing down so so uh so anyway so this is what amos is is talking about and anybody got any questions or comments about amos any thoughts all right so now if you want to jump down to and th those of you who just joined in um over here in the chat i don't know if you can see it i hope you can see it uh, that link goes to the readings for for this Sunday. So so if you want to um, go ahead, you can you can pull those up or if it's not working or something, tell me and I'll, I'll fix it. So then if you look over in the gospel, Luke is going to carry the same idea. And uh, and and he's talking about Jesus giving a parable. This is actually um, it's not a complicated idea. But the way that it is translated and the way that it's written, some of what is very important for understanding the gospel kind of gets lost. And, and, and what I mean is, like, for instance, 
you know, you look about halfway down and it says, and the master commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. And when we read that, we say, what? You know, he's congratulating a guy that was his employee that was basically stealing from him. And then he told him he was going to fire him. So he stole from him again to secure himself a place after he was fired and the and the master is congratulating him um so we'll kind of get into that in just a second okay so it's it's not what it seems how's that it's not what it seems uh you, you it's, it's kind of gets into our understanding of jewish jewish literary styles so in luke so here we go jesus said to his disciples a rich man had a steward who was reported to him for squandering his property when he summoned him and said, what is this I hear about you? Prepare a full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. So he's basically, he's been found out and the master is saying, all right, I, I've heard these rumors. I know what you're doing, but now I want to, I want to see the books. And the steward knows he's been dishonest. And he says, what shall I do now that my master is taking the position of steward away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they may welcome me into their homes. So what, what's happening here is he's calling in. It says he called his master's debtors one by one. So what he's doing is because the master's debtors don't deal with the master, they deal with the steward. And so he's trying to say, OK, my dishonesty made me wealthy, but it also got me fired. And uh, so now that I'm going to be kicked, I'm going to be kicked out of the house. What am I going to do? I've got to figure out what to do so that when I do get kicked out, one of these other people will take me in. OK, so he says to the first, he said, how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 measures of oil. He said to him, here is your promissory note. Sit down and quickly write one for 50. So you see what he's doing. He's giving the guy a 50 percent discount. Right. To the other one, he said, and you, how much do you owe? 100 cores of wheat. He said, here is your promissory note. Write one. For 80. So he's he's cooking the books essentially is what he's doing. Okay. And he's giving them a huge discount. He's he is he is he is forgiving. I, I, I gotta be careful how I say that. He is forgiving huge amounts of their debt. Um, and letting and but he's doing it not because he cares about them, and he's not even necessarily doing it in this sense to cheat his master, he's doing it to gain favor with these people so that when they get, when he gets fired one of these people will say that guy that guy did me a good turn that guy he went out he he did what he needed to do to make sure i was taken care of so now i'll take care of him not realizing though that if you are dishonest even if your dishonesty serves me in this moment mm -hmm but I know that you're dishonest. Am I going to want you as my employee? Probably not, but that Jesus doesn't get into that. But then he says, and the master commended him, commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. So I, the, the, the translation and the way it's worded is, is difficult, but what I'm, what I'm going to try to maybe offer you kind of a, a different translation of it or a different way of reading it, a different con, a, a different, um emphasis right so he's what the math what's really it's it's more like think of it more like the master is saying congratulations you got me okay he's not really like saying my goodness you did a great job that was very prudent of you to cheat me it's more sarcastic like he's saying the the the, the better translation or, or the, the way we would read it the way the jewish people would have read it the way um, you know Luke would have would have heard it, it would have been sarcasm. It would have been like, 
the master said, you know, it's like you outfoxed the fox kind of mentality. Like, I don't like what you did, but I have to admit you won. Okay. Because you're out of my house, but not only did you cost me a bunch of money, but now I can't do anything to you because now you have fr these friends. And even though you're a crook, you somehow are still going to land on your feet and still end up not getting what you actually deserve. That's, that's what the master is saying. Um, because, and what, and when Jesus says acting prudently, what Jesus is trying to get it, get at is that what is considered prudent or what is considered wise in the world is very different than what is considered prudent or wise in, in the spiritual world in, in the kingdom of God. Okay, so then he goes on and he says, for the children of this world are more, are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. So again, there's a little bit of that Jewish, sarcastic, rabbinic style, that kind of hyperbole um, where you're, you're, it's, it's kind of tongue in cheek. And he's basically saying that worldly people are always going to be better at being worldly than people whose hearts and minds are focused on God. People whose hearts and minds are focused on God are never going to be as, as, as good. They're never going to be as shrewd and as um, vindictive and, and as, as sneaky, right. As people who are only concerned with acquiring wealth and status in this world. G.K. Chesterton, right? I, I know you guys hear me talk about G.K. Chesterton a lot, but G.K. Chesterton, I like what he, you know, he said, he said, the problem with the very wealthy is that to get that much money, you have to be dull enough to want it, right? That was the idea that if to get Fab and remember, he lived in the era of like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and, and, and all and the Astors and all of that. So he's saying that to, to get that level of wealth, which is so far beyond what anybody would even that would just be considered to be living like a comfortable middle class, even upper middle class existence, to get this level of wealth your whole life has to be about that. Your whole life has to be about money and acquiring money. Uh, and, and so this is what Jesus is saying. And then he says, I tell you, and this is again, sarcasm, just so you guys know, I tell you, he says, uh, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth so that when it fails, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That is sarcasm. And he basically is saying, you're going to hell. He's saying, I tell you, make friends for yourselves with that dishonest wealth. You better really like what you're doing. You better, this, this better be your version of heaven to live like this because when it fails and it will fail, you will be welcomed into your eternal dwelling. And I hope it was worth it. That's, that's what he's saying, you know, is all that is, is everything you did to live that way on earth going to be worth it when you're spending an eternity in hell? That that's essentially what he's at. Now I, I, I do also want to clarify that in Jesus's day and, and, Obviously, this is a perennial idea, but in Jesus's day, especially the the distance between the very wealthy and the very poor was astronomical. OK, um, you know, I would say like, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, e even someone that is not high on the economic ladder is still living pretty well compared to the way a lot of people live in the rest of the world. And yes, we do have people that are billionaires and are living in a way that most of us can't even fathom how a person, how, what would you even do with all that money? I, I don't, they find build rockets, I guess. Um, but you know, what would you even do with all that money? But we are not 
destitute because they have that. Okay. And I think that's, that would be, I would say one of the differences between, whereas in Jesus's day for these people to have this level of wealth, the other people are, are, are now just absolutely destitute. They are living literally hand to mouth. Um, and so that these, and, and, and many of them are living in, in what is almost like an indentured servitude to these very wealthy people where they are servants in their households, they work on their farms and because they work on the farms and are servants in the household, they're given housing on the farm and in the household. And because of that, if they lose their job on the farm, they don't just lose their job. They lose their house. They lose their, their bed. They lose their kitchen. They lose the meals that are provided. They lose every, they lose everything. So it's kind of like uh, in the United States, you know, when we used to have the, what they talk about like the old, um, like in the coal mining area, right, where they would have like, you know, the, the, the company would build the town and the company had the store and the company had the grocery store, the company ran the school, company owned the houses, and they set it up to where you went into debt to move in there and start working. And they had it set up where you could never really get out of debt with the company. And the only way to quit was to pay off what you owed to the company store, but they had it set up to make sure you never could quite, never could quite do it. Um, so then he goes and he says, the person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. And so, so here again, now, now what he's saying is <clears throat> if I can trust you to do little things, I can trust you to do big things. But if you can't even be trusted with a little thing, how can you be trusted with a big thing? Um, and this is a commentary that in the parable, remember, he's talking to the disciples. That was, if you remember the very first line of the parable, Jesus said to his disciples. So he's not in, th in this instance, he's not talking to one of his crowds but he's talking specifically to his disciples. And what he's trying to get them is like, if, if you are my disciple and you can be trusted to do little things, then when the time comes, you can be trusted to do great things, which would be to bring the gospel to the world. But if you prove yourself to be dishonest in little things, then how, how can you, how, how can the church trust you with, with big things. Okay. He says, if therefore you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, which by that, that he means the, the wealth of the world, who will trust you with true wealth? True wealth is the, is the faith, the things of God, spiritual wealth. And he's saying like, if, if you are dishonest with the way you deal with worldly things, then can God trust you with things that are of much greater value? And Jesus is essentially by asking the question, he's saying no, um, that if if you can't even be trusted to do what's right in a worldly sense, how can you be trusted to do what's right in a heavenly sense? And then he says, if you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? And that's an odd one, but I, I, I think, and I'll, I'll kind of use an analogy for that. I think of it like, you know, with my kids, if you, ask, if they ask me if they can borrow my phone to, to call one of their friends or to do something, and I say yes, and they abuse that privilege, then they are not trustworthy with what belongs to me. So why would I give you a phone? Why would I then, if I can't even trust you to use my phone when you ask for it without being dishonest, without doing what you're not supposed to be doing. Why would you think that I would buy you a phone, right? That I don't always see what you're doing and I don't, and, and I don't have it with me all the time and you have to come ask for it. That's what Jesus is saying. If, and, and of course what he's talking about is with the faith. If you can't, if you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another who will give you what is yours? No servant can serve two masters. 
And this is very true. I mean, this is very true. We can't serve two masters. Um, he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon is the world. And he's not, and I do want to clarify because this is, this is a big one, but it goes, it kind of goes like this. All right. So if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, God, every, every time, you know, a day of creation passes, God says, and it was good, right? And then finally, with the creation of humanity, God says, and it was very good. So creation itself is good. Okay, there is nothing wrong, there is nothing evil about creation. Um, so when we talk about mammon, mammon is not the world in the sense of the trees and the ocean and, you know, dogs and cats and everything else. Mammon is human business, okay, uh, human enterprise in the world. So when he's saying you can't serve God and mammon, of course we can, we can, well, we, we should not be serving creation either because God made us stewards of creation, not servants of creation. But, uh, but the idea is, yes, of course we can, we can, we can love the created world and we should, and we can honor and, and acknowledge the beauty of the created world because God created us, created it for us so that we could live in a beautiful place and be surrounded by beauty. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, again, and, and so I, I don't want you to think that Jesus is saying you're not allowed to have nice things or you're not allowed to want to have a, a, a beautiful, comfortable home for you and your family. No, no, he's not saying that at all. But what he's saying is be careful where your worship falls. OK, at the end of the day, where is your worship? Are you worshiping? You know, dollars or are you worshiping God? Are you worshiping your status in the human world? Uh, are you worshiping the fact that you live in a certain neighborhood, drive a certain kind of car, use a certain kind of golf club, you know, fly in a certain kind of plane, whatever it may be, or are you worshiping God? And if you're worshiping God, then love flows out of that. So love of neighbor, love of creation, love of family, love of your, you know, love of your community, love of your country, all of that flows out of love of love of God, but the love of God comes first. Okay. So um, that's the gospel. Anybody have any questions, any thoughts or comments? You know, the gospel was so long. I thought, this tonight was going to go really long, but we'll see. We may be done in, in 40 minutes. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not, that doesn't bother me. So turn, uh, go, if you now want to look at the, the reading from Timothy. So the reading from Timothy, he says, uh, beloved, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Uh, first of all, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, thanksgiving be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may live, lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. So this is one of the famous parts of, of Paul's letters where uh, the church takes the direction of, you know, that regardless of what we think about our political leaders, we still pray for them. You know, we pray that in their hearts, their hearts will be turned and that they will focus their lives, even though they are political leaders, they will be focused on serving God and trying to live a godly life and using the power and authority that they have to create a godly society. So we, we pray for our lead. Even if we don't like them, we still pray for them. Um, and so, so this is, this is where that comes from, but then further, if you also look, it's, it's a prayer of praying that even those people who are turned completely to the world might be saved. And it's a prayer of that, you know, God, again, God created the world. So we want the world to be a tranquil place full of devotion 
and dignity. And then he says, this is good and pleasing to God, our Savior, who wills everyone to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. This kind of stems from last week. If you remember, last week's readings were about the finding of the lost sheep, um, that God, God wants everyone to be saved. God, God wants everyone to come to that knowledge of the truth. He's not going to make anyone do anything. He's not going to coerce anyone into anything, but he wants everyone to be saved. And he says, for there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and man, that the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as ransom for all. This was the testimony at the proper time. For this, I was appointed preacher and apostle. I am speaking the truth. I am not lying. Teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. It is my wish then that in every place men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. This is the opposite of what Amos was talking about and the opposite of what Jesus was illustrating in the parable. This is Paul, this here, this is where we're saying, this is what someone living for the kingdom of God looks like, thinks about things like that versus the kingdom of man. Um, so again, that's, that's, this is what we should be working towards uh, is, is to, to be like this in, in whatever way that manifests itself in our own lives. Okay. So, wow, that was quick. Okay. So anybody got any questions? Any thoughts? If you guys are good, I'll let I'll let you go early. We'll just have a really nice early night. Um, okay, so all right, well, good deal. Then uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close with a prayer, and I'll let you all go. And I will see you next week. Okay, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So have a good evening and I will see you next time.